Good morning. We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee. I am uh, Kate Stewart, the chair, and I'm joined by uh, Council Vice President Andrew Friedson and Council Member Katz, the other committee members. And today we have Council Member Don Lukey joining us. Um, we have four items on our agenda today, and we are going to start with the OLO report 2023-4, developing data strategies for future emergencies. So we have um, Ms. Simmons with us and Mr. Roblin, and I'm gonna just turn it over to both of you to go through the presentation today. All right, great, thank you. All right, so good morning. Uh, my name is Caitlin Simmons. This is my colleague, Stephen Roblin, with the Office of Legislative Oversight. We appreciate the opportunity to brief the GO Committee on OLO Report 2023-4, Developing Data Strategies for Future Emergencies. Uh, so in past emergencies, such as the 2008 financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, the county was flooded with federal and state relief funds to help residents and organizations. And this presented the county with a challenge, whether to disperse relief funds as quickly as possible or whether to delay dispensing relief funds to ensure optimal compliance with grant criteria and to achieve outcomes as effectively and efficiently as possible. So this memorandum report responds to this challenge. The council requested OLO to examine how county agencies could better collect and track data for emergency relief funds in a way that would not delay the flow of funds in future emergencies. To conduct this study, we, at a high level, examined how the county used data during the COVID-19 pandemic response. We interviewed jurisdictions that effectively tracked and publicly responded um, and reported the use and performance of relief funds as well as reviewed literature on data-driven government practice and emergency financial management. And we use this information to identify promising practices that would aid the county in better using data to track and report on the use of relief funds during future emergencies. So today we'll go over the highlights of the report, including an overview of some of the challenges the county experienced in using data during the pandemic, findings from outside jurisdictions that OLO interviewed, a summary of the report's findings and all of those recommendations. So to inform our investigation into how the county can better track relief funds in future emergencies, we examined at a high level some of the data challenges the county government encountered during the pandemic. So what were some of the core challenges? Well, first, due to the speed of incoming relief funds, from the federal and state governments, county departments had to quickly create and implement grant programs, often with insufficient and changing guidance from the feds and state. And among the data-related challenges this created for certain programs were insufficient training to address variation in levels of data literacy among staff, inefficient and non-standardized data collection processes, and inconsistent eligibility decisions. Second, due to the size and decentralization of county government, departments generally have developed data infrastructures and processes in an ad hoc manner. This resulted in significant differences in how departments, departments and offices collect, maintain, and publish data. So this made it difficult to share and use data across departments and also contributed to non-standard data collection processes, which can which required considerable staff time to manually process and clean data. So to identify how the county can better track relief funds in future emergencies, we looked to outside jurisdictions that adopted a relatively robust data-informed emergency response during the pandemic. We interviewed staff from nine local governments. We selected these governments because they went beyond basic relief tracking during the pandemic. They also tracked and publicly reported on the use and performance of pandemic relief funds. And we asked them questions on how they leveraged data in their emergency response, the challenges they experienced in doing so, and the lessons that can be applied to future emergencies. Now, interviewees described how they leveraged data in developing and tracking relief funds and programs during the pandemic. First, these governments took advantage of data infrastructure and processes they had developed prior to the pandemic. 
They used existing data to shape the initial development of key relief programs, which helped them target early relief to residents and organizations with the greatest need. And second, over the course of the pandemic, these governments collected and analyzed data that tracked residents and organizations who, need, who continued to need government assistance. They also used data to remove barriers to access and to adjust eligibility requirements for certain relief programs. Interviewees also raised several common challenges they encountered when tracking relief funds and programs. First, they often had to build data infrastructure and processes for pandemic relief programs while implementing these programs. And a common metaphor we heard during our interviews was they were, quote, building the airplane while flying it. And second, due to changing federal and state guidelines, they had to modify applications and data collection processes in order to stay compliant. And third, in order to more robustly track relief programs than required, they had to provide additional training at a time when training and workload demands were already high. So the interviewees identified several lessons on what's required for local governments to effectively track relief funds and programs during emergencies. Two of the lessons are, first, it's essential to enter an emergency with mature data processes, infrastructure, and culture, and with a history of ongoing cross-departmental data collaboration. Doing so establishes the organizational capacity that is required for local governments to robustly track government relief funds during emergencies. And second, it's essential for leadership to establish a central recovery team at the start of the emergency that provides guidance on data practices, gives data analytic teams the authority they need to work effectively within and across agencies, and requires data analysts to be involved in the early stages of developing relief programs. All right, so now I'll present the promising practices for tracking relief during emergencies that we drew from our interviews of jurisdictions and reviews of literature on data-driven government practice and emergency financial management. So the report's main finding is establishing a government-wide data strategy prior to an emergency is key to responding quickly and accurately with a data-driven approach in emergency times. Developing a data strategy includes creating standardized data practices and processes that encourages data-driven decision-making, such as processes for requesting data across departments. Olo also found, uh, through a review of literature and interviews with other jurisdictions, that developing strong organizational data collection, analysis, and tracking practices during non-emergency times is necessary to harness data during an emergency response and recovery period. Jurisdictions interviewed by OLO report leveraging their existing data infrastructure to inform and shape the development and public tracking of pandemic relief fund programs. So local governments can build mature data processes and infrastructure by conducting a data inventory, improving the cleanliness and quality of data, um, providing data literacy for all employees to develop a baseline knowledge of data and its uses, and developing mechanisms for deep and persistent collaboration and data sharing between and within departments. OLO also found guidance from, the, from FEMA, which states that during emergencies, it's essential to have a central organization where government leaders can coordinate and direct emergency efforts, as well as collect and analyze data. Within the central organization, FEMA recommends the inclusion of a team with individuals that have both IT and grant management experience to ensure that data is being collected and utilized correctly, and can also respond efficiently to shifting federal and state grant requirements during an emergency. So centralization can help expedite emergency responses through the following methods. Uh, collecting, analyzing, and sharing data, including an organization-wide centralized repository for tracking relief funds and expenses. Providing a central team for the allocation and tracking of emergency funds, as well as a central location for the administration of relief programs. And providing coordination and policy direction, such as determining current and future needs of the community. So to prepare for a centralized response prior to an emergency, establishing a data-driven sharing culture across all departments can break down silos and lead to better communication across the organization. 
This can, in turn, make it easier to launch a centralized response when emergencies occur. There's a few steps to take in preparing the county's data culture, specifically data-driven decision-making and data sharing prior to an emergency. So the first step is to gain explicit support and buy-in from leadership across the organization, and leaders should be willing to work with employees and other departments to establish standard data processes and uses. It's also important to solve common data access and use issues. So for example, across an organization, there could be multiple ways of inputting the same data point, um, such as a different format for zip codes. And if it isn't standard, it can take more staff time uh, to clean up and compare data. So time could be spent elsewhere responding to an emergency. And finally, creating mechanisms for regular communication and data sharing between departments can lead to opportunities for collaboration between departments, which in turn will aid in data sharing during an emergency response. So now we'll turn to, oh, sorry. Now we'll turn to OLO's recommendations. So based on the promising practices, we identified three core recommendations that the county can act on now in order to prepare for tracking relief funds and programs in a future emergency. So first, to build the organizational capacity required for tracking relief funds during an emergency, the county should expand its capacity for cross-departmental data collaboration. This could involve expanding county stats capacity and departments establishing formal data sharing processes and selecting personnel to serve as, quote, data liaisons who would lead and facilitate collaboration across departments. And this recommendation would help establish the culture and history of data collaboration that the county could draw on when establishing and implementing data-informed relief programs in future emergencies. And second, to further build the organizational capacity needed in a future emergency, the county should conduct data literacy trainings that focus on creating a shared understanding on how to leverage county data. So now the federal government's 2020 data strategy um, directed all federal agencies to conduct a gap analysis of data skills to see where weaknesses and training needs lie. The county could consider adopting a similar countywide initiative followed by trainings that address the needs. And this recommendation would help ensure that county staff are prepared to implement a data-informed approach in the next emergency response. And third, to help the county quickly set up relief programs in future emergencies, the county should develop a general data framework that every department can later refer to. So this framework would involve developing a set of universal questions that guides departments on deciding on the data requirements and processes for future relief programs and providing county departments with this tool would help them officially decide on the data they need and want to collect and avoid various data processing efficiencies in future emergencies and in the agenda of our report we um, included two complementary frameworks that could serve as potential candidates for this framework I'm referring to so thank you all. This concludes our presentation and I will turn the discussion back to the committee chair. Great, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. And I don't know if we have folks from County Stat or the, the County Exec's office who would like to join us, no? Okay, um, <laughs> for the conversation. All right, um, great. Uh, so as we're, we're looking at this, I guess one of the questions, and you did touch upon this in the report a little bit, um, is w where are we in your estimation um, in the county right now? Um, you know, we have these practices from other places. We know we have work to do, um, but w what's the status right now of where we are? Well, our report focused more, um, was less of a deep analysis of the county's data cap uh, capabilities. It was more on finding those jurisdictions that performed well in this regard and pulling out the lessons. But in our report, we do provide like a data maturity assessment. It's a framework um, based on the University of Chicago's program, I believe. But that's something that could be a used to assess data maturity across data, uh, county departments. But that would take a, a much uh, 
more robust assessment of where the county is and we, what we did in the report. Thank you. Um, my colleague, do you have any? Yeah, Council Member Lucas. Um, so, in talking about standardizing how the data would be collected so that you have to do less coding, recoding later, um, who would own the creation and the implementation of that file data layout format? Within the county, who would be in charge of that? Um, so that wasn't in the scope of the report, but it's a great question. Um, at least from our research, I think that we're at um, the point where we need to assess um, and see which uh, department leaders and which departments should take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, we do recognize it'd be an enormous effort, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming you would create like a data dictionary and a data inventory and a guidance document for how you capture the things that goes along with that template and it was going to require the input of many different stakeholders, but ultimately someone has to, you know, <laughs> hold that and be responsible for updating and doing the housekeeping on it. So um, just something to keep in the back of your mind. And, and have you thought through, based on lessons learned through this emergency, it's always easier when you're collecting data and specifying the data you want to have that you know what it is you're going to be analyzing later because if you come up with an analysis later and the data wasn't collected for that purpose, it's harder to to do the analysis. So um, are there certain types of things that you've distilled that you say these are things we know we need to know about our programs, about implementation, and this is this will drive our data um, policy? That's a great question. I think the framework is actually a tool to help you walk through those mm -hmm, processes, mm -hmm. those questions. So it basically takes you from step A to Z in terms of you know, establishing the data requirements that you would need, but they really focus on, in the beginning, like, what do you want to know? Right. And that's the key thing, right. because, like mm -hmm. you said, if you're trying to collect data after the fact to answer a question that you didn't, that wasn't raised in the beginning, it's often not gonna be there. So right. it has to go down to, like, okay, so what's the purpose of this program? What are the inputs? and outputs that we want to measure, often the inputs are like dollars and mm -hmm. outputs will be whatever it is that's being um, you know, allocated or dispersed. But then also another question is like, are you interested in evaluating specific outcomes? And outcomes right. is different than, right. uh, than outputs. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, with uh, we interviewed, uh, was it San Francisco, they had uh, an emergency uh, food relief program so they could tell you how, how many um, meals they provided, but that's separate from to what extent did that program actually leave hunger right. or food insecurity right. in that juris jurisdiction. And in some cases it could be worth trying to collect data on those outcomes. In other cases it may not be, but the framework would help departments, um, um, programs walk through those, those steps and those questions. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for this report. It's obviously you've done a wonderful, it, as always, the Oil Lab does a great job, and, and this proves it once again. You know, an emergency is is uh, is one case of what we have to think about, but but um, and in this case, no one thought that we were going to have this emergency. I mean, you know, every hundred years uh, is is not something that we net. Um, necessarily believe is going to happen again. I mean, though we have those hundred year floods that happen a couple times in a week anymore, but, but otherwise I mean, it's not something we n normally think about. And to uh, Council Member Lukey's point, uh, who's in charge is, a, is an extremely important, I don't know that OLO needs to answer that, but that is an extremely important question. Somebody needs to keep their arms around this. And to your point about insufficient training, you know, I, I, I think that it's one thing to have insufficient training during an emergency, didn't plan on it, didn't think about it, we're not gonna have it. So the question is, how are we gonna have su the sufficient training now that we know that we need it? And, and what does it mean? And I think your report is spot on for, the, for what we need and how we need it and, and all of those sorts of things. 
but I also believe that that um, we need to have information like, and it, it, you, you, you touched on it in two, two seconds ago, but we need to have information like we know how many, like uh, you're saying, I guess San Francisco said, this is how many meals we, we provided, but we also need to have information on how many meals we should have been providing. Because that, in some cases, it, it, though we're very glad that we were able to do what we did, it, 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 we might not have been able to say that we did enough and how we should have done it. So I think your recommendations make a lot of sense. I think they're very practical. And I think we need to have those continued conversations and someone being in charge to figure out what's the next steps on this. Because, you know, though hopefully we will never have this emergency again. I can believe sincerely, unfortunately, we're going to have emergencies in some way, some form, from the, you know, in, in other ways. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will note that Bill Gates did predict yeah. that we were going to have this uh, very similar uh, pandemic. We just weren't smart enough to listen. But um, first of all, thank you for the report and for all the work that you have done. Um, I think it's important that we learn from other jurisdictions. Too often we think we do things better or differently than everybody else, and we think that's a good thing, and sometimes it is, but you know, oftentimes uh, you know, it helps uh, to just follow what other people are doing, seeing what works, and implementing it here, and I think we should do that. And you know, we also have you know, what is arguably the most challenging but most significant stress test that we've ever faced, and so you know, we have a lot that we can look back on what did and didn't happen. You know, I, I am interested not only in some of the inputs and outputs and the data that has been discussed largely here, but in some of the areas where we know we didn't collect data properly that hurt us. So for instance, uh, we didn't know the type of data that needed to be collected in order to get FEMA reimbursements. And we're never gonna get reimbursed for tens of millions of dollars of FEMA reimbursements because we weren't collecting the data properly. We weren't cataloging the hours and the work. And uh, it's not to blame anybody for that. It's just to recognize that that was a mistake uh, that now we know. We didn't know then that that was going to be required. And so, you know, there are a hundred examples, a thousand examples of things like that, that I think we can go back and look not just to what other jurisdictions are doing, but to do the, the, the debrief internally of what worked and what didn't work, where we fell short. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's important to note that we worked very hard. County employees worked very hard. County residents stepped up and, you know, we fared better than most, although still, you know, tragically uh, in so many cases for so many families. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of things that we did that we need to do better next time. And you know, I think to me, that's the, the kind of second piece of this question on, on the data is not uh, just on figuring out food distribution and all these other areas that I actually think we did pretty well and making it a little bit more systematic and making it a little bit more uh, data uh, focused so that we can you know, assess how we're doing and uh, how to do it better. Uh, but also to make sure that we're documenting and, 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 and keeping the data in a way that you know, allows us to compete for federal dollars and state dollars and allows us to you know, ensure that we're you know, being careful stewards of, uh, uh, of taxpayer money. So um, yeah, I hope that this report plus the work that, that uh, Dr. Stoddard and others in the executive branch are doing to take a deep dive into you know, the uh, what went well and what needs to improve can be merged in some way uh, and that we can look at you know what are other jurisdictions did that that we can learn from and what we did and didn't do and what we could learn from and then you know i would hope that you know we could have some type of uh report i know that the executive branch had been uh working on that but i think this should be part of it too um, and so perhaps we can suggest that uh, to the executive branch and to dr stoddard and and, and others to look at uh you know the work that they're doing but also what other jurisdictions did as part of that um, you know, post-game analysis, so to speak. So I uh, appreciate all the work. Uh, I think this is really important. And uh, now we, to a certain degree, know what we didn't know. 
uh, which will be helpful for the next time. Hopefully it won't be nearly as severe, uh, but uh, we are gonna face challenges and emergencies moving forward. They might be shorter. They might have uh, more targeted impact, uh, but we need to be ready for them. And, and I think this report will help us do that. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you again so much. And um, I will say your full report is uh, really helpful. Um, and um, one of the things that as I was asking about before my first question was on uh, page 21 of the report, you do talk about like Montgomery County and um, you talk about county, uh, how we have county stat and the, no the vast number of departments we have across and the challenges um, that we face. Um, and I think you've laid that out well and best practices and um, as my colleagues have raised, this is this is sort of a, a, um, a, a step in a, in a process. And I'm going to recommend to my colleagues on the committee that uh, the GO committee send a letter to the county exec's office um, asking um, that uh, they look at the recommendations from this OLO report um, and let us know, um, you know, the work that they're doing now and uh, whether or not they can move forward and implement um, these recommendations. Agreement. Agreement on that? Yeah, sure. Great. All right, I think then we're done. Thank you so much for this. And again, thank you for all your excellent work. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we will now move to our next item, which is the disposition of the White Flint remnant properties. Mr. Mia is joining us and some other folks. Thank you. And I'm just going to say I am so happy this is before us today and moving forward and I know my colleagues um, are as well. Um, you know this is um, as it says in the uh, in the packet, uh, you know this will uh, move us forward in uh, particularly the North Bethesda area um, with uh, furthering our lab capacity uh, in the county and we're we're glad to see that we're able to uh, take this step today. So Mr. Mia, I'm gonna turn it over to you to walk us through the packet. Okay, sure. Um, there's no significant issues with the dis disposition from staff's opinion. Uh, the packet has a lot of background. Uh, I did want to note two, two uh, items really. Uh, one is the history of the site. Uh, for many years it was envisioned to be developed by Gables as a mixed use uh, multifamily uh, with a commercial component as well as a parking garage. Uh, to serve both the uh, development site as well as the uh, adjacent uh, garage, uh, park and uh, aquatic center. Um, because of delays in the road construction and road network in the area as well as mar changing market conditions, uh, Gable sold their interest to Stonebridge who is now proposing the um, development proposal in front of you today as a lab space um, mini campus essentially. The garage component does remain uh, within the project plans. Um, right now, um, a minimum 100 parking spaces is being uh, um, proposed, but that number will change depending on negotiations with DGS. Uh, I would note that Gables had planned to um, reserve approximately 400 spaces, so there's some numbers that can be negotiated in that, in that space. Um, other than that, um, the, um, the only other item to note is the uh, county's uh, CIP contains a wall park garage uh, project. Uh, for 6.5 million, that was originally um, or planned on the Gables development site for 250 spaces initially. The um, again, we're expecting an updated CIP in the next CIP uh, cycle to update those costs based on what the ultimate parking number number of parking spaces will be. Um, other than that, I don't have any other uh, comments. Great. The folks from DGS, you don't have any? Uh, just briefly, good morning, Greg Austin, Department of General Services. Um, uh, as the chair notes, we are very excited about finally moving this project forward. I, as Mr. Mia mentioned, this has been, um, this was born out of the White Flint sector plan many, many years ago, and, and we've all been working on it since then. And um, with the dynamic change uh, between ownership and interest and moving forward with Evolution Labs in an exciting new project is, is certainly something that the executive branch is um, very uh, uh, excited about. Um, just a couple of notes, as Mr. Mia mentioned, customary thorough packets, so we really don't have anything to add, except uh, you will see a CIP amendment at some po point for the Wall Park project, uh, mostly to change the, the narrative and the, uh, and the details because we are working with a different partner. Um, the, the short version is the numbers will not change, so we are still working with the original appropriation, and so we've, uh, at the time that we bring over the CIP amendment, we will be um, 
uh, 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 able to d discuss in more detail how we've achieved uh, meeting the parking needs of the existing facilities for both the Parks Department as well as, as DGS and our REC colleagues, um, all within the original CIP appropriation. So uh, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've got a path forward and we'd be more than happy to talk about that when we bring the CIP amendment over and that is forthcoming this summer. Um, uh, Evolution Labs did receive its uh, plan approvals just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were in attendance for that, and so we are seeking your approval of the declaration of no further need, which is generally a technical matter, but uh, we provided the full picture here in the packet, and Mr. Me has done an excellent job of capturing everything. Um, but for the purposes of today, simply requesting approval of the, the executive's declaration of no further needs so that we can put these properties into play, execute a general development agreement in the, in the upcoming weeks, and then um, uh, the, the game plan is that Stonebridge would be ready uh, pulling permits and off and running this fall. So um, we're excited to move forward and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much for that update. Um, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you. First of all, I'm very excited about this. I uh, want to acknowledge and, and uh, thank uh, the chair for, for her work. Uh, this started uh, when I represented this uh, community in this area, North Bethesda. I really appreciate all the work, uh, Mr. Assant and your team uh, working together and collaboratively and then uh, passing the baton and all the work that, uh, that uh, Councilmember Stewart, Chair Stewart, has done uh, uh, up to this point. Um, Last council had two significant zoning text amendments that we approved that really facilitated biohealth in the county uh, and to double down on our global leadership uh, in that regard. Uh, 2109 has gotten most of the attention that reduced the regulatory review process by 75%. We're looking at uh, expanding that to affordable housing uh, as well with a new zoning text amendment uh, that uh, I've introduced with uh, council member sales. Uh, but uh, the one that And uh, Montgomery County has really flourished in the suburban uh, biohealth campus type uh, uh, area. Uh, but uh, the, the, the goal, as we have set in our economic development strategic plan, to go from third or fourth to first or second uh, nationally in, in, in uh, biohealth, we need to do really, really well, if not be the best at both. And uh, this will help us do that. And so it's really exciting to see this project, uh, which is taking advantage of that zoning text amendment for uh, the first time, and I hope is the first of many uh, of these similar projects that are going to bring high quality jobs and life changing research and life saving technology uh, right here uh, in Montgomery County. So, um, really appreciate all the work. I'm really excited. Uh, about this. Uh, it really does show the, the fruits of the labor of the last council really coming to fruition at the beginning of this council. I know the work that we're going to do over the next few years, uh, we plant the seeds and the next council gets to uh, enjoy the fruit. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully we can continue on uh, in that uh, direction. So uh, with that, uh, I'm very excited to move forward with this and I'll yield back to you, Madam Chair. I did learn a lot from uh, representing the Ag Reserve. Yes, yeah. 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 No, right. works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, any other comments or questions? All right. I, all those in favor on the committee of moving forward this recommendation to council? That is unanimous. Thank you. Um, and I think you all are staying right here for the next uh, piece for the disposition of uh, Emory Grove. And that's, I think, why Council Member Lukey has joined us today. And Mr. Meir, I'll turn it back to you. Sure. Uh, this is another disposition. This time, the county is proposing to transfer a parcel of uh, county-owned property to the HOS Housing Opportunities Commission for purposes of developing uh, housing development. There's actually three properties involved in the development. Uh, two are not subject to disposition as they are going um, uh, or being proposed for transfer to HOC for housing development. The third site, uh, the one, the subject site here, is a closed school property that uh, has to go through a separate disposition process uh, for slightly enhanced scrutiny given that's this closed school site. Um, really no issues with this one. I think um, in the packet contains the background and development site. We're looking at a total of 330, up to 336 housing units across all three parcels. Um, the main parcel, which again is not subject to this process, is the uh, surface parking lots at the Upper County Community Center and Outdoor Pool. The plan is to uh, build, to replace the surface lot with a parking garage and to use the remainder of the site to build um, these housing units. 
The housing units uh, will all be 30% at least, 30% will be NPDUs. Um, the rest will be a mix of rental and for sale. Uh, the Pepper Ridge parcel, which is in the, the subject property, will is envisioned to build uh, 10 for sale townhomes. Um, really, uh, that's it. I think you know. I think the staff is here to talk about um, or to give some indication of what the development timeline could be, um, how many parking spaces would be replaced in the garage, and any other um, comments they may wish to add up at this point. Okay. Sure. Good, good morning again, uh, Greg Austin, Department of General Services. Um, uh, again, a uh, really exciting project um, that we're, this is again just a technical matter of the closed school uh, disposition process, which is a little bit different than the county's disposition process, but be that as it may, we are seeking your approval on the declaration of no further need for uh, what's in your packet on your circle on page four as uh, uh, map designation two, which is the Pepper Ridge uh, uh, school site. but. A uh, bigger picture, uh, HOC, as you, I'm sure you know, uh, HOC approached the county uh, a few years ago with a very, um, very impressive um, redevelopment scenario for the Emory Grove uh, neighborhood and um, some areas that were subject to um, urban renewal many, many years ago. Um, there's a great story to tell. There's lots of presentations. If you haven't seen it, we'll make sure that you have a link. Um, but. Uh, the three county properties uh, that are involved here, one is some old right-of-way, one is obviously the upper county uh, rec facility and outdoor pool, and then, um, and then of course, the, the subject property for today. Um, the, the county executive is committed to involving all three of these properties uh, with a HOC, and as Mr. Mia mentioned, the, HOC, the properties that we intend to do direct negotiations with HOC are not required to receive council approval for that reason because it's a sister agency. Um, so it's really just uh, number two that we're uh, uh, seeking your approval on. Um, but uh, the, the larger context is, is in your packet. Again, we're very excited moving forward. Um, the timeline of the redevelopment, um, there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, HOC is working on partnerships of their own. Um, this is a technical matter to get out of the way so that they are able to go out and secure those partnerships without having to make them contingent on county council approval of the disposition of the lands involved. But beyond that, um, uh, they will establish those partnerships. I believe we're already in negotiations with some and will be moving forward uh, this fall. So uh, happy to um, answer any questions. And if, um, if it uh, is a committee's recommendation, we can always speak with our colleagues at HOC and have them come in and present this fall as well. Thank you. First, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I am certainly aware of this uh, site. I actually went to elementary school there um, <laughs> when it was called Longview. And just as uh, and, and uh, Mr. Assant touched on this, but it was the year in 1955, 56, when was schools in Montgomery County integrated. The at that time it was Longview at uh, Longview Elementary was the African-American elementary school. And Gaithersburg, which was, I don't know, two miles from there, maybe not even that, um, uh, was, not, was, was not integrated. And when the county did integrate, what they did was they bused students from Gaithersburg Elementary to Longview for third and fourth, and I think maybe even fifth grades. And I was one of those people that bused, and that's one of the places that I met my buddy Greg Wims, Delegate Greg Wims. <laughs> um, but what we're about to do, candidly, is correcting an embarrassment in Montgomery County. And there's no other way to say it. They, Montgomery County meant to do well way back when, when they had urban renewal, but they did not. They had promised the families that they would come back and the families did not. The only thing that remained was the Emory Grove Church, Reverend Tim Warner's church. And, and this is an opportunity to correct, though we certainly didn't do it fast enough, to correct what we did so many years ago. So I am certainly very supportive of this and the other projects that are, that are being uh, a part of this, though it's not exactly for this piece of property. Uh, we needed to do it, we are doing it, and I'm very pleased to be a part of correcting what, is, what has been a terrible wrong. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Katzen, um, and thank you for that background and the importance um, 
of this. And just, um, again, I just want to say it is really a pri privilege to serve with you. Um, and to know, to really be able to give this context to the actions that we're taking today and knowing the history of our county. So thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Marquez. I was going to say, uh, I've learned the history of the county. Uh, Councilor Marquez has lived the history uh, in many ways uh, of the county, and that was just a good uh, example uh, of it here. I am just incredibly proud of this project. It is uh, something that the council, the county executive, the Housing Opportunities Commission, Habitat for Humanity, Tim Warner, and uh, Pastor Warner, and, and the church, uh, and the broader community have been all in on. And it is uh, about righting historical wrongs. It is about restorative justice. It is about trying to repair the damage that we did as a county, as a community, as a county government. And so I, I think this is uh, a, just a great example of it. I think it's important to note that this is part of an even broader project. We're going to restore Johnson's local park, which was once one of the great uh, ballparks where uh, some of the, 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 the great black baseball players in the history of the country came to play. Uh, this is a site uh, where tens of thousands of residents from all up and down the eastern seaboard used to come for camp meetings uh, to have fellowship, uh, to band together, to restore their resilience through impossible circumstances. Uh, it was all at this site, and we are now going to restore it to uh, what uh, it uh, was and what it should always have been and what it will once again uh, be. You know, the, the, this is another example of a zoning text amendment that uh, we worked on, was proud to work uh, with Council Member Katz uh, on, on that when Pastor Warner approached us about this project and Housing Opportunities Commission when it was in its infancy uh, and really appreciate the executive and the entire executive branch who have really uh, dug into this. I'll just note over Juneteenth, Weekend, as part of the Scotland uh, Juneteenth Heritage Festival, uh, I was at the Bethesda Blues and Jazz Club uh, with Pastor Warner and a full sellout crowd, uh, and it was transformed into a reenactment of the Dew Drop In. And the Dew Drop In was a music venue uh, in uh, you know at a time when Montgomery County was segregated, where. Uh, rock and roll, which was uh, invented uh, in the black community and, and appropriated uh, by uh, the white community, uh, was uh, celebrated. And it was uh, an incredible night uh, on Saturday night uh, and really you know, br brought us back in that way. But I think it was a reminder of what this community was before it was taken. Uh, and what it could be uh, again, uh, and you know, as I said before, we have to be as intentional in undoing the injustice uh, as uh, we were, uh, and as the county and, and as the community was uh, intentional in doing the damage itself. And this is one of many examples of that important work, and I'm just really excited and proud uh, to be part of it uh, today. Again, this is just one small piece of a much bigger uh, project with a lot more work to do, but. Uh, it is an incredible community-based partnership that the county is uh, really being part of the leadership to right this historical wrong. So with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. Councilmember Lippi. Yes, um, I am super excited about this project and what it means for the community and that finally things are moving forward. And I know I don't get to vote on this today because I'm not part of this committee, so I'll just sit here and smile when they when they all agree uh, on, on moving forward with this. But um, you know, to reflect what my colleagues have already said, I think it's important with all the new things that are coming that will be wonderful that we don't lose sight of the history and that we own the delay and that we reflect that and we remind people of that and, and that we celebrate the new but don't forget the old and make sure that the history of this community is reflected in and around all these developments so that others when you know whether it's it's council member cats having a fireside chat or or andrew giving a history lesson are not available that others may find things to reflect upon embedded within the community itself um, in order to tell that story and keep telling that story so thank you thank you um so 
you know, dispositions usually are fairly dry, straightforward <laughs> things, but I think yeah. th this one and, and the prior one shows uh, where we've been as a county and where we're going in the future. And so, um, you know, I think for, uh, for the Government Operations Committee today, I'm, I'm thrilled that we're able to move both of these forward. And so with that, I'll ask uh, for the committee, all those in favor of the recommendation to council, it's unanimous. Um, and we're done with the disposition uh, for Emory Grove. Thank you very much for coming today. Our final item uh, for the committee today is our FY2429 Tax Supportive Fiscal Plan Summary. Uh, okay, this is the one everybody's here for. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Howard, I think I'll turn it over to you first. Well, this item after the last two may be a little bit less exciting, um, <laughs> but it is an important, right, it is an important um, action that the, the council takes each year to reflect the decisions that were made as part of the operating budget, which you just approved uh, last month. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ambinder to walk through the staff report. Good morning, Council Members. Uh, Logan Ambinder, Postgraduate Fellow with Central Staff. Uh, we're also here with Mr. Waters and Mr. Mullen of OMB, and Ms. Feldman and Mr. Platt of the Department of Finance. Uh, we are here to discuss the Tax Supported Fiscal Plan Summary for FY24 through 29. Uh, this summary reflects the budget that the Council approved uh, a few weeks ago in May. The County Charter requires that the Council approve this summary every June. Uh, updated versions of the fiscal plan will be presented to Council in December and March to reflect changing economic and fiscal conditions. Council staff does recommend approval of this summary as prepared by OMB. Uh, we'll go ahead and go through some of the highlights in the packet. Uh, beginning with page two in the middle of the packet, the policy assumptions, those remain unchanged from previous years with the exception uh, that this plan does assume the 4.7 cent supplemental property tax increase approved by the Council in the most recent budget. Moving on to revenues, uh, the summary table at the top of page three in your packet uh, indicates a, overall a 5.3% projected increase in revenue from fiscal year 23 to 24, followed by smaller increases in the years thereafter. Uh, for property taxes, the highest projected growth rate is also fiscal year 23 through 24. That's a projected 8% increase uh, due to the rate increase that the council approved. Um, this is lower than the uh, rate increase in the previous version of the fiscal plan uh, since the council elected not to adopt the full tax increase recommended by the county executive. Uh, after the 8% increase in FY24, the average annual rate of growth projected in property taxes is 1.7%. Income taxes estimated increase by 2.9% from FY23 to 24, and then by an average of 5.6% each year thereafter. Uh, and recordation and transfer taxes, uh, revenue is estimated to decrease at an annual average rate of 0.3%. This is driven by the estimated decrease of 23.7% from FY23 to 24, uh, but after that, the estimated average change through FY29 is a 4.4% average annual increase. Uh, moving on to available resources in the middle of page three of your packet, we'll just note that uh, available resources are projected to grow by 7.2% from FY23 to 24. Uh, after that, available resources grow at a more constrained rate. Uh, and then moving on to the final portion, fixed commitments, uh, you'll see at the bottom of page three and the top of page four of your packet uh, that debt service, PAYGO, and current revenue funding for the CIP are all at policy levels with regards to reserves. FY23 reserves are projected to end at 14.1%, FY24 reserves projected to end at 11.6%, and the fiscal plan assumes reserves at the 10% policy level for all the years thereafter. So again, council staff recommends approval of the plan, and we're happy to answer any questions or turn it over to colleagues from OMB or finance for comments. Great. Thank you, Mr. Ambinder. Um, does finance or OMB have any additional comments or anything? No? All right. Council Vice President Friesen. Yeah, thanks. So first of all, thanks for the work, and I have no problem with anything that's in the plan. I think it reflects what we've agreed upon. I will stress my concern that the plan clearly states uh, we've got some structural problems here, uh, that the growth rate uh, does not reflect the uh, trajectory of uh, county spending. We're, we're not bringing in as much money as we're projected to spend, and over period of time and not a very long period of time, that's going to present some real challenges. So we don't need to go into 
all of that now, but I do think we need to really grapple with that issue, and I hope we can grapple with it sooner rather than later and not wait till you know, an Armageddon-style battle uh, at the next budget. And so I just wanted to note that. And in that spirit, uh, we have a revenue monitoring group that I you know, moved forward a bill that modeled similarly to the state that is uh, intended to be a collaborative approach between county departments, the legislative branch, office legislative oversight. Um, it's not clear to me that that group has been utilized to the extent that it should be, uh, that it is not as proactively collaborative and grappling with these issues as it needs to be. And so I just hope uh, that as we move forward, as we begin to grapple with these questions on revenue and on economic projections and on expectations, uh, that we really lean into that proactive collaboration to avoid the confrontational nature that we run into when there are wildly different views during the budget cycle of what our reasonable expectations are for the fiscal realities. I've said before, hope is not a fiscal strategy. I think we have tried that. Uh, I think we are running into the realities of that now that the federal revenues are up. Um, and I think that we have a structure that's already in place that could help us to avoid those dynamics. We just have to lean into them a little bit more seriously. So this is my request uh, for that. Uh, I will ask how that group is uh, working and, and when it's meeting and what the intentions are uh, moving forward. But I just wanted to give the broader view that I really think that group needs to be utilized more. So I don't know if there are any you know, thoughts or feedback from the executive branch. If you want to share, that would be great. And then if Mr. Howard, if you have any you know, responses as well, uh, please. Nancy Feldman, uh, Division of, uh, Department of Finance. Um, the Revenue Monitoring Group, the Revenue Estimating Group, however we, we've titled it, um, and I, I seek Mr. Howard's input as well. Um, we have been working in an ongoing way with council staff, uh, executive branch staff, uh, to monitor on a regular basis and meet the schedules that have been laid out in the law. Um, expenditures are not part of our responsibility. Um, that is a broader responsibility of the executive branch and council. Um, and so the revenues are the revenues um, how we get to those numbers, how we, the models that we build and have all been worked through with our, uh, our group and hopefully greater understanding of everything that goes into the revenue forecasting process um, will help understand what our limitations are based on the law that's in effect at the point in time that we're doing the forecasts. So um, there's two parts of a budget story. Um, the Revenue Monitoring Group has one part of that in, in, within scope. Yeah, thank you. I would just um, concur with Ms. Feldman that um, the, you know, the, the group has been, has been a good effort, and I think it's been a great learning experience for everyone who's participated so far as you know, from the council side, from the legislative branch side, as we are um, working more closely and collaboratively with the uh, Department of Finance and understanding their different modeling um, and some of the assumptions that are going into the revenues, then that help, helps us um, as we work with the council in helping you provide you information for your decision making. Um, certainly think that we'll, as we go forward, we'll continue to improve that um, and, you know, and, and keep working to come up with um, you know, different strategies and structures to provide the information that you know, the, both the council and the executive need as, the, as part of the decision making process, uh, both during the budget and then the pre-budget, as you mentioned. Um, when we do the fiscal updates, um, I think that's a that's a good point to provide um, updates on where we are on the revenue estimating group, and also looking you know maybe relooking at the schedule of reports um, that the revenue estimating group provides, and trying to figure out what are the best timelines and time frames um, for you all to receive information that's you know most helpful to, for your decision making. Yeah, I just recommend that we do take uh, those up uh, on uh, a regular periodic basis. I think it's something that the committee should be 
first in uh, on an ongoing basis. I appreciate that, you're, that the group is only playing a role in one. I will note that we do have a requirement for a balanced budget, so these two sides of the same coin should be working in collaboration and coordination. Uh, they shouldn't be uh, divergent, but I think the reality is that they are, and I think one of the dynamics is that there is a view that we budget on an annual basis and therefore you know as long as we make things work for the snapshot in time you know sometimes through some accounting tricks uh, that it's okay and then we'll figure it out next year and we'll do something similar next year and I think we have to get out of that uh, ongoing uh, dynamic and I think uh, this uh, collaborative group could be part of uh, the, the solution to that challenge. But I appreciate the update and hope that we can uh, move forward with that. And I'll yield back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President Friedson. Um, Mr. Howard, maybe if you could send out um, to the committee just an update on the next couple of meetings and, and reminder of the schedule for the, uh, the Revenue Estimating Group. That of course, we'll, we'll certainly do that. Thank you so much. All right. Um, not hearing any other comments or questions. Are we good with making a recommendation to Council on the fiscal plan summary? Yep. We are unanimous, um, so we're good with that. Um, and I think we are done with the business today then of uh, government operations and the fiscal policy committee. Thank you for joining us today.